So welcome to this edition of Seen and Solved. Today, we're speaking again with Connor Calais, who's an application specialist at Hubbard Hall. And today, we're going to continue our conversation about phosphates. Uh, in our previous episode, we spoke about zinc and magnesium phosphates. Today, we're switching over to iron phosphate and zirconium phosphates. I'm Tim Pennington, and you're listening to Seen and Solved, brought to you by Hubbard Hall. Better results, less chemistry. Connor, thanks for joining us again today. Thank you very much for having me. Great. So like I said, we learned a lot about uh, zinc and magnesium. So why would uh, someone choose to use iron phosphates? What are, what are some of the advantages that they would use that in their, uh, in their process? Sure. So when we look at the phosphating as a whole, you know, we talked earlier about how uh, magnesium and zinc phosphate applications can give you a variety of mechanical benefits, but oftentimes what you really just need out of this coating is for it to be able to provide you with appropriate paint adhesion. Because if you're going to be coating apart and then painting over it shortly thereafter, you don't necessarily need some of those other properties that those more conventional methods provide. So when we look at iron phosphate in particular, what it allows us to do is to be able to get us that adhesion on the surface of the bare metal that we want in order for the paint to adhere properly and to be able to have those robust properties out in the field, um, but it does so in a much more similar method. So while you can spray some of the zinc phosphate chemistries, um, typically those zinc and magnesium processes tend to be done more of an application that uses an immersion. Whereas with iron phosphates, you can easily combine those and utilize them in both an immersion process, but also a spray process. So they can be done very easily in a continuous line where you go from your pre-treatment and then they continue on a conveyor immediately into a paint booth. So they allow you to kind of maintain that process in a much more automated manner. Furthermore, these chemistries are a lot simpler in terms of their use. Um, you really don't have all these different factors that you have to worry about. And mainly really all that we have to titrate for on a regular basis is just gonna be the total concentration. You don't have all these cofactors that are gonna be influencing the behavior of them. And they also are a little bit more easier on the wastewater treatment side. I mean, you just have a simple acid chemistry that can go easily into your wastewater treatment and then be treated appropriately for discharge. So they have a lot of advantages in terms of when you're having an applicator just needing those paint adhesions or pre-paint characteristics. Gotcha. You know, I know one thing you guys like to do before you prescribe anything to customers or is, is to look both upstream, downstream, see how it all fits into the, uh, the, the process that's there in front of you. So what sort of upstream processes uh, are considered um, in, in these, in the uh, iron phosphate processes? Sure. So when you're, before you go into an iron phosphate, similar to the other more conventional methods, you want to make sure you have a clean surface on the part. Now, one of the benefits of iron phosphate is you, can have a little bit of residual oxide on the surface and the acidity of the actual phosphate chemistry itself can typically address some of those issues. Um, we definitely want to make sure that your part, your part is free of um, organic soils, but you have a little bit more um, variety in the types of cleaners that you can use that can be more specific to the condition of the part prior to it going into that pretreatment line. So we can use um, I, uh, mildly alkaline or even sometimes neutral cleaners in addition to those caustic cleaners in order to treat that part more appropriately going into before it goes into the phosphate. Additionally, another upstream process that we'll sometimes incorporate um, for parts that either are have recently been brazed or have gone through some sort of um, process where they're going to have some scale on them is you can use a phosphate phosphoric acid based uh, conditioner after you do the cleaning. And for instances where you do have some more of those inorganic soils that may not be most easily removed in a cleaning step, you can kind of do a pre-treatment conditioner, which kind of preps the surface prior to going into the iron phosphate. So let's talk about it. Have you found somebody recently that you've been working with who's using this application? Maybe a kind of a case of how it's been working or any problems you had with it, helping to fix them? Sure. Um, one of our longtime customers that utilizes this iron phosphate chemistry specifically um, is a second tier supplier to um, the off-road engines that you see like with tractors and different heavy duty equipment. They supply a lot of the um, 
tubes and different components prior to those engines being made. And they kind of have multiple different applications where they utilize this chemistry in different ways. For one, they kind of have, like we talked about earlier, a continuous paint booth where they're going into a spray cleaner. Um, there they're using our Aquis PL918, which is um, a heavy duty caustic cleaner that can be both immersion or sprayed. Um, they're able to completely clean the parts prior to going into the um, iron phosphate, which there they're using our Hub Foss 150, and they're spraying that as well. And then they go, after they are in that iron phosphate chemistry, and they continue on to another rinse, and then they go into a sealant. They're using a zirconium-based sealant. And really, when we talk about sealants for iron phosphates in general, you're really not looking for a long-term corrosion protection because you're going to be painting them anyways, right? So what we really are trying to do with that sealant step is mainly prevent any flash rusting or provide some sort of short-term corrosion protection. So that way, when they eventually do get to the paint booth, you're not going through a heated oven and then they're flash rusting, giving you a bunch of corrosion on the parts party paint because that's going to just yield or lend itself to being not the best paint adhesion that you could have. Um, with that applicator as well, they also have um, a brazing operation where they're taking some of these tubes and treating them in a way and bending them into whatever sort of shape that they need. And with that, they get a lot of braze scale that has to be removed. So they go through an immersion process with these types of parts where they're doing a um, an immersion in the same cleaner, but it's run at a higher concentration because they have a lot of lubricants that are much more difficult to remove. So having that um, hot, high temperature cleaner is able to kind of um, remove some of those more difficult lubricants from the surface of the part. And after a rinse, they go into a conditioner, which for their use, they're using, um, it's called Aquafos 12. It is a um, phosphoric acid base conditioner of sorts. It helps remove any of the scale and just gets that surface kind of cleaned up and ready for the iron phosphate to then form in the subsequent step. After that, they go into a rinse and then they usually put on some sort of corrosion protection there as well. And then once those parts are ready to be painted, they get brought back onto that um, circulating booth line and then they're used in that manner there. Right. So were they having a problem that you all came in and fixed for them or was there just uh... Yeah, they've, um, as you know, as um, different suppliers have changed, we've kind of had to modify the process here and there um, with their, uh, Brazing operations, the raw stock that was coming in started, they used a different type of lubricant on the parts and we had to kind of change some things around. And we found that the cleaner that they're using now is much more effective than the previous cleaner that they were using. So we've had to kind of curtail it there. Um, we've also done some work with them in, on that conditioner product where at, over time, that's a, a product, the Aquafos 12 has an inhibitor in it. But after it's used so much, so much iron gets dissolved in it, which starts to deplete the conditioner. So we were able to come up with an indirect control method for them to be able to kind of get a good understanding of where that chemistry is and how much longer it has left before it needs to be recharged. Because they were having a lot of issues with um, corrosion coming on the parts after phosphating them. Right. Yeah, like I said, sometimes you don't you don't know those that uh, the supplier has changed the lubricant or any other type of uh uh, metal cutting fluid or anything until yeah one little change can cause significant problems downstream so you have to be nimble and how you approach the situations for sure right so let's talk about performance testing specifically uh, uh salt spray testing uh because i know that's so important for uh paint adhesion correct i mean how does that work pretty good with the iron phosphate set? sure so there's a number of different methods that are used for determining how effective the paint is adhering to the surface um, a bunch of different organizations and some um, manufacturers even have their own internal standards in terms of how they want the testing to be done. But um, using more common ASTM methods, um, typically what you would do is you take your painted panel, which would be representative of the bare metal that you're gonna be um, painting on, and you'll get them uh, pre-treated and painted accordingly at the applicator site. And then they would send those in for testing. And what we would do is we'd basically do a score down the middle and then subject them to um, a salt spray chamber for a designated amount of a time. And then after so many hours, depending on what specification they're needing, we'll take the panels out and we'll basically um, scrub along the score line in order to determine how much creep there's been on the paint. So if you 
have a panel that's gone in for, let's say, 500 hours, you want to make sure that the average creep of that paint along that score line remains within a certain range. And that's kind of our indirect method for determining how effective the paint adhesion is. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, like I said, I, I, yeah, I wasn't sure if it just measured salt spray or just how well the adhesion works with that, but... Sure, there's a couple other tests that um, sometimes if you have just a very light pretreatment and a very thin coating or thin paint coating that goes onto the part, sometimes you don't need as much of an adhesion, but more so just an environmental stability kind of test where you would just place the painted panel without scoring it in, make sure that it doesn't delaminate or um, doesn't have different or corrosion basically seeping out from within the paint. And then there's also a couple other methods that kind of vary in that you would sometimes do like crosshatch test where you take multiple scores um, perpendicularly to each other and then you basically put a piece of tape, put a piece of tape on the crosshatch and peel it off to see all right, how much paint is being removed when you do that sort of testing as well. So it kind of depends on both the substrate that you're dealing with and what the actual in use of the product or the part that you're painting, where it's going to be um, used in what sort of environment, what sort of properties that you need. Gotcha. All right, let's switch over to zirconium for a bit. Um, how, let's start with just compare and com contrast. How is this uh, similar and different from iron phosphate? So, um, Zirconium is kind of an interesting newer technology. It's starting to be used more and more. It's not something that can be used in every application, but in the application where it is suitable, it's definitely a preferred method to use. So this is not going to give you quite as much of a robust protection as some of your more traditional phosphate methods, but oftentimes you don't necessarily need that same degree of adhesion. Um, this is often used like in hand tools, leans more towards an aesthetic purpose rather than functional purpose. Um, these zirconium products are very versatile in the way that it can be used. Um, you're dealing with a neutral product rather than an acidic product, so it's much more um, environmentally friendly and easier to treat as well. And it's a process that the contact time is much lower than you would need for traditional phosphate. So rather than having to have the part in contact with the solution for three to five to seven minutes, you can usually have the zirconium coating applied in 30 seconds to a minute. And it can also be done at ambient temperatures as well, which is an advantage that a lot of applicators really like the fact that they don't have to heat up a solution, they can apply it ambiently. And since it's more of a passive chemistry as well, you oftentimes can combine, depending on your application, you can combine either a cleaner into the product. So there's a lot of different um, abilities that you have to kind of curtail a tailor-made solution depending on the application that you're working with. Gotcha. And again, I think I've heard a lot of people say before, very friendly to uh, wastewater treatment, correct? Um, uh, easier to use, easier to treat with that, correct? Is that, I guess, like I said, that's one of the huge benefits, right? Or, and, and you mentioned a few there, but others that uh, that uh, would come to mind with zirconium when people are asking about it then? Um, like I said, I'll just reiterate it. Really, one of the biggest advantages of it is its versatility. Um you know, you can have an applicator that had a iron phosphate line already set up and you can use different zirconium based products to fit into that application. And since they're so versatile, you don't have to manufacture or have a whole entire new line built just because you're changing your chemistry. Um, right. You oftentimes don't need um, subsequent rinses after you do the zirconium um, and you can often have it. You can have your process designed to where once you put on that zirconium, you don't even have to dry it off. It just either automatic dries as it's drying into the atmosphere, or um, it's just a lot easier in terms of use. Right. Yeah, these are really, like I said, all-in-one solutions, correct? That uh, The versatility of them, right? I mean, absolutely. And like I said, they're not something that can be used everywhere, but in instances where it can be used, they provide a great advantage. Right. Right. What What are some certain ones that you say can be used for? Can you give an example? I mean, of what uh, even some projects that you've used, recently worked on with with zirconiums being used or? Yeah. So we've seen um, one of the nice things about zirconium is they're not so specific to your substrate that you're using. So you we've used them over aluminum surfaces and over zinc die cast surfaces where they've been able to provide that um, paint adhesion that you might not otherwise get with an iron phosphate. Um, one of the differences in terms of the crystal structure is um, with 
iron phosphate, you're still putting on a microcrystal structure, but when you go to using a zirconium product, it's more, much more on the molecular level where you have this um, modified zirconium molecule that kind of seeds into the surface of the metal at a much smaller level and provides you just a micro microstructure adhesion. Right. <laughs> so imagine it like a sandpaper grit rather than you using a 200 sandpaper grit with the zirconium, it'd be akin to using a 2000 sandpaper grit. Right. So you're, it's a much smaller level, but it still provides you that variation in the surface geometry that you need in order for the paint to properly adhere. Right. And, and as you mentioned, I think earlier when we were talking about zinc and, and magnesium, it, it can, can they refine this? Can finishers dial this in, make changes to the crystal structure or no? Um, not in the same way that we would say with a phosphate. We're really, there's not um, a method where we really determine what we'd call like coating weight with our traditional methods. With um, zirconium, it's much more um, based on your contact time. So if you needed improved performance within a certain application, you would either um, increase the temperature, which some people will use it at a mildly heated level of like 120 to 140 degrees. So increasing that temperature can increase the concentration of those uh, molecules on the surface or increasing the contact time those are kind of more the parameters that we play with in that realm rather than using other chemistries along the way. Right. Is, is there, you know, if people that, that switch from one to the other, is there very much of a, there's not much of a, a, a equipment change, correct? It wouldn't be an equipment change. Would it be just kind of a drop in with that or? Well, typically, so when we do, um, when we're changing someone over from a, if they're wanting to go towards the zirconium way, we'll look at the existing equipment, how it's set up, where they're using their rinses, what tanks or how they're spraying, or if they're using immersion. And we'll try to fit the product in because there's a number of different variations of these zirconium products that we can use. So we can either utilize a zirconium product that has a cleaner built in, or we can keep the existing cleaner and then just change out that phosphate chemistry for zirconium chemistry. And the same on the back end, we can either use a different sealer or keep the same sealer that they were using if they need it, or sometimes they can just turn that or cut that section off altogether. So really, um, we have a lot of flexibility in how we can implement these products on existing lines. Gotcha. Great. Well, listen, this has been an interesting two uh, uh, sessions that we've done. Like I said, today with iron phosphate and zirconium, and like I said when we did previously of zinc and magnesium. That's a lot of information, a lot of lot for a lot of different. Uh, options for for finishers and and, and coders and you know I, like I said it's 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 good to know what those options are because they're, like you said there are so many substrates there are so many different needs and processes that that people could do so having a good knowledge of that is uh, always always helpful with that so Connor thank you for joining us uh, today and great uh, for uh, giving us all that great insight into that absolutely anytime Seen and Solved is brought to you by Hubbard Hall better results less chemistry for more podcasts. Go to HubbardHall.com or wherever you get your podcasts.